Okay. There we go. Awesome. All right. So going to mainly focus on four topics here today. Um, climatology. You introduce, introduce yourself first. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm John. I'm going to mainly focus on um, John Nielsen Gammon. I'm the, I'm the Texas State Climatologist. I've been the Texas State Climatologist for 24 years. I've been in Texas for 33 years. Uh, grew up in Northern California, went to school in Massachusetts, uh, been at Texas A&M since 1991. And my research started out basically focusing on weather, but uh, I became the state climatologist in 2000, and I've been focusing more and more on climate and climate-related issues since then. And I also, um, after I became the state climatologist, I was invited to write the chapter on climate for the Texas Master Naturalist Handbook, and so that got me a gig uh, talking about it occasionally, although get to get to look at the, the present state of the climate and what we know about things now, which is a bit different from the emphases and stuff we knew a um, decade or two ago when, when I wrote the stuff. Now, the local climatology has not changed a whole lot. Um, the reason we talk about local climatology and climate and all of that in the context of Texas natural nationalists is because ecosystems are dependent upon the weather. Um, key aspects that determine what sort of ecosystem you've got include the amount of rainfall you get on an annual basis, uh, temperatures, um, sunshine provides the energy for everything to work, either directly or indirectly. Um, plants use the sunlight directly for energy. And animals use the sunlight indirectly for energy by eating plants. And other animals use the energy even more indirectly by eating animals. So it, uh, but it all builds upon the, the process of photosynthesis. For the most part, it's not really the averages that matter, but it's the, the range of conditions. Typically, organisms are tolerant of a range of conditions and there are some ideal conditions we can thrive at, but it's uh, when they get beyond those extremes that uh, they essentially can no longer exist in a particular area. Uh, in Texas, there are a variety of issues relating to that. For example, uh, plants have to be drought tolerant, especially in West Texas where um, things are started off dry in the first place, have to be able to tolerate the heat of the summer, and they have to be able to tolerate the cold of wintertime. Now, if the earth was completely covered with ocean, there probably wouldn't be a state of Texas, but if you imagine where Texas is, its climate would be basically identical to everywhere else on earth that had the same latitude. There'd be nothing to differentiate that location from any other location. Of course, longitude, I'm um, oh, sorry, different latitudes would make a difference because uh, that determines the amount of sunlight and uh, thus indirectly the, the, the temperatures that we get. But it's not just ocean. We've got land and we've got topography on the land surface. So to understand Texas climate in particular, uh, we got to look at where Texas is situated geographically. So first off, um, we've got sloping terrain in Texas from the Gulf Coast out up to West Texas, even some mountains in parts of West Texas, but the topography keeps increasing into New Mexico and Colorado. That topography basically forms a barrier to low-level air coming from the Pacific Ocean. So it's fairly rare that we actually have winds blowing from the west in the state of Texas. Most of the time, winds are either from the south or from the north. Uh, south winds are coming from the Gulf of Mexico. And that air is typically what we call a marine air mass. It's, it's going to have fairly consistent temperatures, fairly high humidity, and it's probably been picking up marine influences all the way from the, from the subtropical Atlantic. Um, in the summertime, 
Our wind is almost entirely day after day out of the south and southeast. And consequently, we have almost exactly the same weather day after day. Uh, differences happen when the wind comes from the north, uh, which can happen on almost any month of the year, but mainly um, September through late May, early June. And uh, to the north of Texas is not ocean, it's land. And so the air is continental, which can mean fairly large swings of temperature. And since we're talking about land to the north, that means we typically get cold air when the wind is from the north. Um, the mountains that I talked about as terms of blocking air coming from the Pacific, they also block air trying to go in the other direction. It might be trying to go from the central United States out to the western United States. Instead, that air runs up against the Rocky Mountains and gets channeled southward. And that's a topographic effect that leads to very strong cold fronts in Texas. They're known commonly as blue northers. Um, we get the cold air that basically funneled down along the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains and it blasts through Texas. Particularly strong cold air outbreaks can sweep all the way through Texas, down the Gulf of Mexico, across eastern Mexico. Some of that cold air might sneak over the Isthmus of Tuatapec into the Pacific Ocean. Some of it can, continues under the Caribbean and might not make it to the Pacific until it reaches Panama. So that's our topographic setting. Let's see how that affects our temperatures and our uh, rainfall. We'll start with rainfall, annual precipitation. Uh, for the United States, you can see... Um, Pretty distinct difference between the western United States and the eastern United States. A lot of detail in the western United States because of the topography. Um, rainfall occurs when air ascends and gets cold enough that the water vapor condenses. And, of course, if the wind is blowing over a mountain range, air is ascending on the windward side of the mountain range is descending on the leeward side. So it's pretty easy, for example, to pick out where the Sierra Nevada is in California because the winds are typically from the west, and so the upwind side of those mountains gets a lot of precipitation. Downwind of it in western Nevada, there's very little precipitation. So a lot of stuff going on, a lot of details in the rainfall in western United States. Eastern United States, it's a whole lot simpler. Um, more precipitation in the southern United States and the northern, but at least where Texas is, it's basically an east to west variation. The easternmost part of Texas is the wettest part of Texas. We get about 60 inches of rain in a given year, on average. As you go farther and farther west, things get drier and drier, so that by the time you're approaching El Paso, average rainfall is less than, a, than 10 inches. So, big variation in Texas. Uh, the mountains have a little bit of an effect. Hill country has a little bit of an effect, but mainly it's an east-west variation of rainfall. Rainfall also, let's see, how are we going to do questions? I guess if anybody has a question, you can probably raise your hand, and I think it will show up on my screen. I'll be able to answer your question. Um, huh. I'm not going to be monitoring the chat, but if... Uh, if there's a moderator that spots something in the chat that wants me to, to address, I'm, go I'm, ahead and speak up. I'm going to ask you this one. For example, today, what happens when we get like one inch here in Tomball along Spring Creek and another area gets almost nothing? How does is there is there any real correlation to what's happening with these uh, large bodies of water, these creeks and stuff, and these rivers that we have here? Well, typically, typically the question I get about variations of rainfall is why do storms always seem to split and move around uh, my location? And I get that question no matter what the location. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the the answer is it's a perception thing. Um, there's a lot of variation 
from event to event, storm to storm, but if you add things up over multiple years, it basically evens out. Um, okay. There's a little bit okay. of an effect with the topography, but you know you can't tell. Uh, there's no clue from this where the where where uh, Lake Livingston is, or Sam Rayburn, or or the or anything like that. It's just uh, not having a big influence on rainfall okay. patterns. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I I, I have to, I've often felt that way. It almost seems like it's almost like random. Uh, uh, but not, but not random. But uh, but I get you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's it's it's, you know, it's it wouldn't be random if we knew exactly what the variations of water vapor and temperature were in the atmosphere everywhere. But we can't possibly have thermometers everywhere. So, in terms of being able to predict it, it's essentially random. We can tell hey, there's a good chance of stuff happening, but where exactly storms fire and where they go. Uh, you can't really tell ahead of time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at this month by month, starting in January. And here there's an even bigger variation from east to west. Uh, typical January rainfall in, in west Texas can be as low as three-tenths of an inch compared to five or six inches in east Texas. So that's a factor of 20 difference. And the reason for such a big difference is the Gulf of Mexico only goes up to Brownsville. And you've got mountains blocking any southerly flow from in the rest of Texas. And the winds in the wintertime tend to be large scale blowing from west to east. And so it's hard to get moisture up all the way into the interior part of Texas. It's easy for moisture to go from south to north. And so we tend to have a large variation of rainfall depending on which places are able to get moisture from the Gulf of Mexico in any given storm event. As I step forward month by month, uh, things sort of even out a bit more slowly and rainfall increases across much of the state. Um, by May, you see a dramatic increase. Large fraction of central and eastern Texas typically gets four or more inches during just the month of May. And June, not quite as wet, but still fairly wet across the state. So May and June is our peak period for rainfall still not getting as much as they get farther north in oklahoma and kansas uh, this is also our peak of severe weather uh, in april and may and so that's happening um, with storms basically forming along the dry line or ahead of the dry line and then particularly in may and june getting organized into uh, convective systems like squall lines and just moving from west to east or northwest to southeast and dumping a lot of moisture and possibly some severe weather as well. Uh, we lose that variability in the weather by July. And in fact, July looks pretty dry for most of the state. It's the driest month of the year in general, with a couple of exceptions. You see there's still precipitation along the coast because this is where we get the sea breeze developing and tending to... Uh, trigger some afternoon thunderstorms along the coast. There's also, by the way, some evidence that precipitation is enhanced locally by the Houston metropolitan area in terms of uh, basically disturbing the, the, the airflow and altering the, the temperature and humidity. Um, Houston is obviously a pretty big place, much bigger than, say, Galveston Bay, which shows up as a tiny tick here. Another exception is out west. We don't have that west to east variation of rainfall anymore. And in fact, uh, some of the wettest places are in the mountains in west Texas, as well as up in the panhandle. Um, that's part of what's called the southwestern monsoon. Uh, it's also the wet time of year for much of the desert parts of Arizona and New Mexico. So they're looking to July and August for a large fraction of their annual rainfall, whereas in most of the rest of Texas, we're looking at as a sort of a minimum of rainfall. So go forward a couple of months and things have gotten wetter in West Texas and drier in East Texas. Sort of secondary peak of rainfall in September and October associated partly with hurricanes and tropical disturbances, which are most common in 
September, and also uh, partly due to the fact that ocean temperatures tend to peak in September and October, so we get the greatest amount of moisture coming into the state in September and October, and it's there to basically be wrung out of the air by traveling weather disturbances. And back into November and December, and we have that west-east variation again. I'll go ahead and go back and forward, just to give you a chance to look at some other part of the country if you want to, and see how the variations we see in Texas are very much different from the variations you get in other parts of the United States. Okay, so the simplest thing about the rainfall is it's wetter to the east and drier to the west. Simplest thing about the temperature is it's uh, hottest to the south and coldest to the north. Annual temperatures vary by about 20 degrees from south Texas to north Texas, which is a sizable variation. And that too has a seasonal variety to it. Obviously, it's colder in the wintertime than the summertime, so no big surprise that the average daily maximum temperature in January is uh, quite chilly. The average daily minimum temperature in January is chilly too. In fact, in the panhandle, we're talking about an average temperature in the low 20s to upper teens, whereas South Padre Island is still having average minimum temperatures in the 50s. So big variation in the wintertime, almost no variation in the summertime. The hottest parts of Texas are no longer necessarily South Texas. You've got sort of uh, <clears throat> three or four hot spots. The Laredo area tends to be quite warm. Wichita Falls area tends to be warm. Midland and Pegasus area tends to be warm. And although it's kind of hard to see here, the area along the Rio Grande and Big Bend tends to be quite warm also. And that's true for maximum temperatures and to some extent minimum temperatures, although minimum temperatures are highest along the coast as well as in urban areas with Dallas-Fort Worth showing up on this. Notice how big an effect topography has on the maximum temperatures. It's a lot cooler during, in the high altitude parts of the state and also to some extent you can barely make it out where the, where the altitudes are locally higher than the surroundings such as the hill country. We've, we've had some weird things occurring up in the Panhandle area recently. Um, and a lot of people are getting really concerned about like the uh, uh, tropical storm where I know I know you can't predict that. I'm not saying that you can do it. But is there anything that is in your mind that looks odd? It just, I, I mean, we 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 even get to that later yeah, of what could happen with uh, uh, what we've had with uh, things occur in this area. And, yeah, I'll be talking. I'll be talking about tropical storms later. Um, I think I might have some fire slides on here also. If if not, I'll. I'll, okay. I'll yes. Up, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't want to, but yeah, I, I've I've seen some weird some I, I've seen some weird stuff, but I I want to hear from the experts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. For the first few years, I was a state climatologist. My basic job description consisted of telling people, uh, "No, actually, this sort of thing has happened before." Um, mm -hmm. Can't necessarily say that as much now because the climate actually has changed a bit. But for the most part, things aren't. As bizarre as they seem. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Of course, in Texas, for temper it's not just the temperature in the summertime that matters, it's the humidity. Here's a plot mm -hmm. of the average dew point temperatures in Texas, and uh, it's typically in the low 70s across uh, coastal Texas and southeast Texas. It gets drier as you go farther, farther west, of course. Um, and that may make it seem like uh, evaporation rates are probably highest in East Texas, but actually what matters for evaporation is not how much water is in the air, but how much could be in the air that isn't there already. And we measure that for something called the vapor pressure deficit. Apologies for the 
technical term there. But the the higher that value is, the more rapidly things dry out. And we see West Texas is sort of a hot spot for that. Not nearly in the Mojave Desert, but uh, things dry out a lot more there. and They stay more humid without evaporating so much rapidly along the coast. No, oh, thank you. I, I didn't mean to put it. I, I, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. I, I, I don't know. I, I just read a little bit about this, and I'm like, I'm a fool. Okay, <laughs> I'm a fool, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Now, those are, those are average conditions. Um, now, as I mentioned, climate is also about extremes. It's about variations from year to year. So um, here's here's one way of looking at that. This is a plot from left to right of the May through August precipitation in inches. And the vertical axis is the summertime average temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. And each one of these dots is one year of data, or one summer anyway. And you can see that there is a bit of a relationship there. This is if you put a line to this, it's got a downward slope. The the wetter things are, the cooler the summertime temperatures. And conversely, uh, the drier things are, the hotter the temperature tends to be. And that's a fairly fundamental aspect of how the climate works. Um, so I want to just take a momentary step here to talk about how we get our daily temperatures. The naive thinking would be, oh, the sun comes out, it warms the air, and so it gets hotter during the day which would be fine, I suppose, if that worked that way. But it doesn't because the atmosphere is pretty much transparent to sunlight uh, or visible light of any form, which is why we're actually able to see through the air. If air absorbed light, there wouldn't be much of it left to get to our eyes. So our own experience is that sunlight makes it through the atmosphere. It doesn't make it through the Earth's surface. It gets absorbed there. And uh, the air doesn't heat up itself. It heats up when it comes in contact with the hotter ground surface as the ground heats during the day. Now, another thing going on during the day is water evaporating, plants transpiring through their stomata. And both of those things, the heating of the air and ground and the evaporation of water take energy. And that's energy that came from the absorbed sunlight. So there's a trade-off here. If the day's sunny, you pretty much know how much energy you're going to get from the sun. But the amount of water that's available to evaporate determines how much of that energy goes into evaporation and how much of it goes into heating the air. The more water we have, the more evaporation there is, the less heating there tends to be. Now, we can see that pretty dramatically through this uh, pair of satellite images looking at uh, uh, eastern Washington. Uh, so we've got... Um, the Columbia River going through the middle here, and it's, it's color-coded blue, uh, but the satellite data is in green here, looking at a measure of the extent of vegetation, so actively growing vegetation. You see a lot of dots. Those are center pivot irrigation systems um, where there's plenty of water in the summertime growing crops, alfalfa and the like. Whereas the drier areas uh, don't receive much rain during the summertime, and so the grasses have become dormant. Down the bottom is a view of the same area, but now we're looking at the actual temperature of the land surface at the same, same instant. And all of those dots come out dark, which corresponds to cool temperatures, whereas the areas that are dry are experiencing much higher land surface temperatures. Uh, 40 degrees Celsius is triple digit Fahrenheit temperatures. So it's easy to see directly that if you got a lot of moisture, you're not going to get a lot of high temperatures and vice versa. Now in 2011 in Texas, we had drought that started in October and went all the way through the next summer. This is a view near Fredericksburg where uh, even the cactus were, were shriveled and trying to conserve water. So all of the sun's energy was going into heating the ground, and none of it was going into evaporating water. So take a look at this plot again. You can see that 
uh, you can have a four four degree temperature difference averaged over the summertime, depending on how much rain you get. Rainfall doesn't tell you exactly how hot the temperature is going to be, but it gives you a clue. So in 2011, May through August precipitation was just a little over four inches. So if you're going to make a prediction for how, if you knew how much rain you're going to get, how hot would it be that summer? You could you could look at this graph and say, well, gee, looks like uh, you know, extend that line, get about 85 degrees average summer temperature, which would be record-setting heat. So record dry rainfall in this case would correspond to record high temperatures. Now the data I plotted here are only 1895 to 1997. I'm going to add a few more years of data here and fit a separate line through there. You can see that in the first part of the 21st century, there's this tendency for the combination of rainfall and temperature to be in the upper part of the cluster of points. And that's a reflection of um, just the increase of temperature that we've seen in general across the state. There's still large variations depending on how much rainfall you get, but with a given amount of rainfall, you tend to be hotter than you would have been in the previous century. And so here we can make an updated forecast, um, 86, 87 degrees. Uh, maybe we still have some heating going on, so we're, we're 2011 might even be above 87. Well, it comes out about 87. And the other points in the second decade of the 20th century are also near the top of the envelope. Um, in fact, uh, Five of these 10 points are are outside of the historic envelope at the top end. And let's add, finally, the last three years of data. Um, admittedly, that's not a, very much to have confidence in what the slope of the line ought to look like. But it is pretty clear that these lines are gradually progressing upward, which means even though the even as the rainfall amounts don't seem to be changing much, we're, we're definitely getting higher temperatures for a given amount of rainfall. And that was enough so that even though rainfall wasn't dramatically low during the past couple of years, we still have the second and third hottest summers on record. So temperature and basically all of our weather is a product of some combination of natural variability and uh, the gradually changing climate. And we see the natural variability from the large range of dots and the change in climate from how those dots are gradually migrating upward on this graph. Can I ask a question? Sure, um, go ahead. This is Tammy and Brian Sinclair. You may have touched on this at the beginning. We were a little late signing on, but I'm curious if you have a, an idea of what our summer is going to look like at this point. If it's so warm already and I'm worried if you know it's going to be another really hot miserable summer well um it's uh unfortunately the the official seasonal outlook for april through june is for below normal rainfall and from that and from this graph uh it seems like a pretty good bet that we'll have above normal temperatures this summer also thank you you're welcome. Now, actually, the variability of weather is bigger in the winter than the summer, and that's mainly because of something that's called El Nino. Here are the average uh, temperatures in the tropical Pacific Ocean during a few historical El Nino years. And we're looking at temperatures compared to normal. And you can see this, there's this basically tongue of warm water extending from South America along the equator, uh, as far at least as Hawaii, beyond Hawaii. And all six of these have usually warm temperatures right along the equator. Now that affects our weather in a couple of ways. It's... The, the flip side of El Nino, by the way, is La Nina, which is when temperatures are unusually cold in those same areas. So you can basically think of it as 
cold water is sloshing up toward the surface of the Pacific Ocean and then descending again. And because there's so much rain, so much thunderstorm activity in the tropics, you can dramatically change the distribution of that rain by changing the ocean temperatures like this. With La Nina, uh, thunderstorms are suppressed where the temperatures are cold, and so you get more rain in Indonesia. With El Nino, thunderstorms move out across the Pacific Ocean, and they're a bit less than normal in Indonesia. And that affects the whole jet stream pattern. That affects the weather in many parts of the globe including the United States. And we can get a sense of its effect in the United States by looking at average conditions during El Nino years and La Nina years. So here are the departures from normal rainfall during El Nino years. And Texas gets mostly blues, which is above normal rainfall during El Nino. Same thing applies to California, Florida, and the whole Gulf Coast. So typical El Nino year will be wetter than normal. Uh, typical El Nino year, at least historically, used to also be cooler than normal. You see temperatures running about a degree Fahrenheit or so below normal in this average compared to, say, three or four degrees above normal uh, up in the northern plains. I say that's the way it used to be because because of temperatures going up by over half a degree per decade, um, and normal being average conditions over the past few decades, um, the change in temperature it, we've experienced over the past few decades is as large as the change in temperature expected by El Nino, but in the opposite direction. Temperatures have been warming, El Nino causes cooling, two effects combined actually to near normal temperatures. So. Our expectation for El Nino is now above normal rainfall and near normal temperatures. Uh, what actually ended up happening this past year was in Texas, for the most part, above normal rainfall. And for the most part, near normal temperatures, actually about one or two degrees above normal. Uh, but this variation in temperature really held true because from North Dakota to Wisconsin, temperatures were actually around 10 degrees above normal averaged over the entire December, January, February period. So they came about as close to not having a winter as you can come under current climatic conditions. Can you can you address that a little bit? I, I read this article one time, and, and again, I mean, you're the expert on this, that it said what you do is almost like trying to pinpoint something on the earth that you can't do with water okay it, it, it's not really possible it's like a, how do how do you actually predict how you're going to get rain how you're going to get uh ice how is it going to happen i mean is it that difficult i i because it's like every year it's going to get odd I, does, does that make any sense to you? Yeah, for, for, for seasonal forecasting, you can't really uh, predict anything too specific. And in fact, these are these are averages. Uh, in reality, maybe about one third of all El Nino years end up being drier than normal. Um, so it's just basically tilting the odds in a particular direction. But yeah, the, the weather from year from 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 day to day and week to week, uh, can be can be quite variable. In 2021, we had the uh, extreme cold air outbreak in the middle of February. We had those two cold weeks in the middle of February, but every other week during December, January, February is well above normal. So, um, yeah, your individual weather conditions may vary considerably from these averages. Yeah, you made a mistake, though, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> right, sir. <laughs> right. You well, I was only I was only yeah. predicting the average. I wasn't predicting what would happen in the middle of right, no, I was, no, but I mean, it's like everybody expects that it's gonna. Oh, you got it. We got it. Right. You know, we got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, this is La Nina, which is sort of the opposite of El Nino, as I mentioned. It's the opposite in terms of rainfall. Also, it tends to be drier than normal during the winter time. It tends to be warmer than normal during the winter time. Now, admittedly, 
the rain we care about is mostly summertime rain because that's when we get their big drought impacts. And unfortunately, there's not a really big relationship between rainfall and El Nino in the summer. Uh, this is average May through September, and basically there's a lot of white and pastels, which is probably mostly random variations. So uh, we don't have a good way of, of predicting summertime uh, weather conditions in general. Uh, the one exception to that is probably hurricanes. Uh, there's decent amount of skill in predicting the severity of the Atlantic hurricane season because some of the factors that go into it are easy to see in advance. For example, right now El Nino is weakening and it's certain to become La Nina pretty much by, by late summer. And with La Nina, thunderstorms move back over to the West Pacific. Um, there's less um, wind shear in the Atlantic as a result of that, and it's easier for hurricanes to form. Plus, uh, water temperatures in the Atlantic right now are 1 to 2 degrees Celsius above normal, and they're not going to cool off by the summertime very much. And that also favors formation of hurricanes. So even though most of the official hurricane forecasts don't come out for a couple months, uh, I'm willing to go on a limb and say that we're going to uh, likely have an active hurricane season. Uh, doesn't mean we're going to get a hurricane in Texas. Active season means maybe a one in two chance of something making landfall in Texas. Um, but um, it's probably going to be an active year for the reasons I talked about. Okay, so I've, I've mentioned the climate's changing. We saw that in the summer, and we'll take a look at that um, in a little bit more detail in a moment. But I want to talk about what causes the climate to change. And it's not just humans. It's not just nature. And climate scientists can actually do a pretty good job of telling the two apart and figuring out what was, what was happening at different times. Uh, the reason is because even though the climate system's complex, things that drive changes in the climate system are pretty straightforward. Basically, you've got a certain amount of energy coming into the climate system and a certain amount of energy being radiated out to space by the climate system. And if there's more coming in than goes out, then the climate system warms. There's more going out than coming in, the climate system cools. So anything that triggers an imbalance in, that, in those energy flows, either incoming or outgoing, can cause climate change. So here's some of the natural things that can do that. If the sun becomes less intense, there'll be less energy coming in. That can cause climate change. Um, if the uh, pattern of continents moves around um, so that we've got land masses sitting over the north and south poles that can allow snow to accumulate there, or reflects more sunlight, that can cause climate change. Uh, we get a lot of volcanic activity over millions of years. That can that can increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, conversely, uh, just over a two or three year period, there's less dust put, produced by volcanic activity that can cool the Earth temporarily. And, and another thing that plate tectonics does is it actually affects the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere too, because um, weathering of exposed rock of a certain type actually absorbs carbon dioxide, triggers chemical reactions on the rock surface. And there's a few other things that, that can, can matter at, at different times. Uh, orbital variations are actually pretty small. They only tend to matter because and when uh, they can take and affect feedbacks. So a feedback in the climate system is something that's not driving a change but it's something that's responding to a change in the climate system and at the same time, either amplifying that change or reducing that change. So snow and ice is a good example. As you might imagine, if the earth got cooler, we'd have more snow and ice and snow and ice are white. They reflect sunlight. So if we have more snow and ice, there's less energy getting absorbed by the climate system. So the climate system becomes cooler. That's a positive feedback. Um, now, it, a positive feedback doesn't mean an unstoppable feedback. You can have stable positive feedbacks. You can have unstable positive feedbacks, depending on how strong the feedback is. So little footnote to Earth's history, there have been maybe two or three occasions 
when the snow and ice feedback was strong enough to essentially run away. And we ended up with almost the entire Earth's surface covered with snow and ice. Um, scientists give it the somewhat evocative name, Snowball Earth. So um, it is possible for climate feedback to run away, but it's fairly rare for it to happen. Uh, vegetation is another feedback. Amount of vegetation determines how much energy gets absorbed because vegetation is a different color, different reflectivity than the barren terrain. Uh, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. You get more water vapor if temperatures are warm, and that will trap more energy. So positive feedback there. And other greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide and methane, have, uh, have, have, have natural cycles that can respond to temperatures and serve as feedbacks. So unnatural drivers, um, some of these are the same as the natural drivers, um, like vegetative cover. That can respond to climate change or it can respond to man clearing land for irrigation and agriculture, for example, or urbanization. So uh, those are things that affect the climate now that didn't used to affect it. Um, greenhouse gases uh, can can be affected by man if they sort of uh, removed from from places where they've been stored or or uh, reactions are enhanced so that they can develop more rapidly and then get emitted in the atmosphere. So for carbon dioxide. And we're digging up basically carbon dioxide in the form of fossil fuels that's been buried for millions of years and putting it back in the atmosphere. Um, and then aerosol, small particles, um, that's mainly air pollution. And it has a cooling effect on the Earth's climate, but clearly not as strong enough of a cooling effect to overcome what greenhouse gases are doing uh, because the Earth's system has been warming. Um Aerosols affect things because they sort of uh, produce haze so they can reduce the amount of radiation reaching the Earth's surface. But they also have a really neat role to play with clouds. You know, we think of clouds as being these nice pure things composed of, of water, but water vapor, the gas, is transparent. We can't see it. What we see in clouds is tiny water droplets. And water droplets or, or, or tiny ice crystals don't really form spontaneously. They have to, the water has to condense onto something. So every single cloud droplet you see is, is, is water surrounding some particle in the air that's not water. Could be a sulfate aerosol, could be a piece of pollen, could be some dust, could be a crystal of sea salt. Um, but it's not pure water, and for that matter, rain, which is made of thousands of, aeros of water droplets that have come together, is not pure water either, although it's certainly pretty pure compared to most of the other ways you can get water. I mentioned that because clouds have such a big role to play in the amount of energy getting absorbed by the Earth and, and being emitted by the Earth. And the interaction between these particles and clouds is really complicated. For example, in the upper left, this is a, a satellite image off the coast of California, and these curved lines out here that don't look natural because they aren't natural, they're what we call ship tracks. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, um, a large fraction of the pollution in the Earth was by the diesel engines on ships. So they're spewing all these tiny particles into the atmosphere into a relatively clean marine environment and all of these cloud droplets can suddenly start condensing. Um, and so you form this layer of cloud because of the pollution that's there. Now, the other image is sort of just the opposite thing happening. Turns out if you've got um, liquid water in clouds and it cools, it doesn't tend to form ice right away. Uh, because it's got to crystallize onto something, just like a water droplet had to condense onto something. And if things get cold enough, then it'll form ice, maybe around minus 40 degrees. But until then, you can easily have clouds that that are just basically called supercooled water, below below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you provide 
particles to that cloud that can, can that ice can form onto, all that super cold water will basically transform itself into ice particles. That's the, one of the main principles behind cloud seeding. And what we see here is a layer of super cold water and ordinary airline flights, passenger aircraft, flying within that layer of cloud or flying through that layer of cloud uh, are basically uh, causing those clouds to form ice crystals and snow, but then falls out uh, toward the ground, probably evaporates before it reaches the ground, but it leaves a hole in the cloud deck. In fact, these are called hole punch clouds. And some of them, they're fresh enough, you can actually see the ice crystal clouds in the middle of the streak. You know, there's, they've been around long enough that almost all the ice has, has fallen down and fallen out and maybe re-evaporated again. Uh, but boy, good luck simulating all of this with a climate model that is only simulating average conditions over, over a, a 30,000 square mile area. Okay, bringing it down locally, what's been happening in Texas, the, um, what I'm going to show you is from our report on extreme weather in Texas. Um, an update is due out within the next month. So uh, watch your favorite website for that one. It won't show up there, but you can still watch your favorite website for that one. Uh, you can go to our favorite website and you'll, you'll be able to find it anyway. Um, I want to show you what's been going on basically Give you a sneak peek what's been going on with our climate. Um, first off, the coldest temperature. I mentioned uh, February 2021. Uh, the state temperature average, if you average the coldest temperature at any given station, it got down to less than two degrees Fahrenheit. So, really cold. Uh, wasn't the coldest ever. There were a few colder than that. But that's in the context of temperatures that normally don't really drop down below 10 degrees much. And the long-term slow variations are that basically for the past three or four decades, it's been warmer than normal. We haven't had extreme cold. Um, there's two points I want to make about this. Uh, first off, um, despite um, statements that climate change is making extreme cold worse, uh, it's not. Really, extreme cold is still less severe than it used to be. Uh, second point, though, is that uh, the near disaster we had in 2021 was a combination of two things. First, how low this point was. Uh, and secondly, the lack of cold temperatures anywhere near that during the previous three decades. ERCOT was formed in 1996, I believe it was. And we didn't have any of these moderately cold events to stress the system and see how well things could handle moderate cold. And then instead of getting a point up around 8 or around 6, we ended up with a point around 1 degree. And so that was such a shock to the system that a lot of things went wrong that in retrospect shouldn't have gone wrong. And in the future, if, if people are doing their job, won't go wrong again. Uh, but in a sense, the you know you could argue we were lucky to not have extreme cold for a while, but it turned out we were unlucky because it made the consequences of the cold that did finally arrive that much worse. Of course, these ecosystems are responding to uh, climate conditions depending on how rapidly plants and animals and insects can spread. Um, so this was a period of time in which uh, uh, warm Temperature loving plants were able to migrate northward across Texas and then hard freeze hits, and uh, they suddenly discover they're not perfectly suited to the climate after all. This also, of course, is the experience of gardeners in Texas. And in that context, the climate zones that the USDA publishes regarding hardiness for plants is based on 1991 to 2020, which is the period starting just after this point. And just before that point. So I bet you that the the uh, the current hardiness maps are overestimating hardiness for Texas because this was a very special period without very much in the way of extreme cold. More so than you'd expect just from a, the long-term trend from climate change. 
Okay. Um, I want to talk about other aspects of Texas climate in the context of drought. And I guess before I do that, we're, we're almost up to eight o'clock. So this is this is probably a good time to uh, pause for questions and, and take a little bit of a break um, because we're sort of at the midway point of the talk. So see if anybody has any questions. Um, I was looking back. There was a question way back about when you're talking about the things that were causing change like plate tectonics and things like that. Um, the question was solar flares would also be one of those. Uh, solar flares are, are electromagnetic disturbances. They don't really uh, change, do much in the way of a total amount of energy being absorbed by the Earth. Probably there'll be a bigger impact uh, by the eclipse next month than there would be by a giant solar flare. But there are certainly solar cycles so that uh, in uh, uh, during, during an active sunspot period, uh, there could be uh, an increase of about uh, uh, 0.01 to 0.02 percent in the amount of sunlight being emitted by the sun and consequently the amount being absorbed. So it's it's just barely enough to be detectable, uh, but it's not enough to be noticeable. Okay. You can get you can get bigger variations over longer periods of time, like the Little Ice Age was probably mostly or at least partly volcanic activity, but also the sun was unusually quiescent. And so that led to temperatures being a few tenths of a degree colder than they might have been otherwise. Great. Thanks. Um, we want to take a few minute break back in, back in like five, five to 10. What do you, what do you, what do you want? Five or 10? Let's compromise. Let's say right now I've got 758. Now it's 759. Let's say 806. Okay. Sounds awesome. <laughs> All right.
All right, welcome back. And if you're not back yet, welcome back when you get back. Um, I'm going to uh, pick it up where I left off with uh, considerations on what's going to happen with drought. And the first obvious question for that is, is rainfall going to increase or decrease? Let's take a look at what we see with rainfall. Um, across the state, the, the trend has generally been an increase. The uh, majority of the state has seen rainfall go up by uh, close to 1% per decade, which over a century comes out to a quite a large number. Uh, but we've seen drying in much of the eastern part, sorry, much of the western part of the state. And we also have a lot of variation from year to year. This is the average monthly rainfall in each year from 1897 to the present. And you can see there is a general upward trend, although uh, recent years haven't been as wet as they were in, say, the 1980s and 1990s. Climate models, um, probably about two-thirds of them say Texas gets drier, about one-third say it gets wetter. Most of them are saying slight changes. Um, like, uh, you know, less than 5% over several decades, which is, which is smaller than the sorts of changes we've seen historically. So, um, we're, we're sort of on the dividing line, the hinge point between places to the north and east where it definitely gets wetter and places to the south and west where it definitely gets drier. Uh, but as it is, um, although what does happen to rainfall is going to be important, we don't really know what's going to happen to rainfall. At least there's not a simple answer for it. So maybe we get more, maybe we get less. Uh, but there's a lot more room on this slide for other considerations. What else is there? Well, how hot is it? Because uh, rainfall comes down, but then it evaporates. And the more rapidly it evaporates, the drier things can get. So here's the trend in temperature across the state of Texas. And temperatures are going up in much of the state by more than half a degree per decade. That's over the past five decades. So we're talking two and a half to three degrees of increase. And in terms of the average maximum temperatures, they're going up in every season at about the same rate. The average daily minimum temperatures are going up in every season by about the same rate. Um, so um, pretty consistent picture in terms of long-term increase of temperatures in Texas. So, yep, going up. And is that enough to overwhelm much of the rainfall effect? Well, it would require more rainfall just to sort of hold our own against the greater evaporation. But there are a few other factors that we still have to take into account. For example, the timing of the rainfall. If the rainfall tends to happen more in the wintertime than the summertime, then you could um, easily um, see drier conditions when it matters. Uh, but there's lots of variability in, in terms of when the rain happens and what the projections are. So there's not much to go on there. Um, it seems like rainfall is becoming more variable, though. Um, here's a plot, again, of the annual rainfall amounts. And if we ignore 2011, that the one year where we averaged less than one inch of rain per month, um, it certainly looks like over the past half century, the variability has increased. The, the scatter is broadening. Um, and climate change also says that the variability of rainfall ought to increase, but uh, not by this much. It's not supposed to double over 50 years. And if we look back farther, we see that, gee, there was just as much variability in the early part of the 20th century as there has been in the early part of the 21st. So while we certainly would have the, the visceral impression that rainfall has become more erratic in Texas, uh, if you look all the way across the climatological record, it really hasn't, at least not enough to be able to, to, to notice. Now, another thing going on is we care about drought for a couple of reasons. One is human water supply. 
And another is agriculture for farming and ranching and for ecosystems. And if, if there is some way that plants could get by with less water, then maybe less rainfall wouldn't be so bad. Well, turns out there is. It's the same fact as dominating the climate change itself, which is carbon dioxide. Uh, stomata, the, the pores on the leaves, they they open and release water vapor while they're absorbing carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide becomes the basis of photosynthesis and the carbon forms the the organic molecules that constitute the, the, the plants. If there's more carbon dioxide in the air, then the stomata don't have to be open as much and they lose less water. So the the water use efficiency of plants is improving because of the carbon dioxide. So, if that were a big enough effect, then it could overwhelm, say, the increase in temperature, causing things to dry out more. Um, it turns out it's probably not. And one of the reasons is that we've got some studies that say it isn't. Uh, but also, we can't assume that plants are going to behave themselves and say, Hey, I don't need as much water. I'll I'll uh, I'll just use less water and be just as happy as I was before. Instead, those plants are probably going to say, "Hey, I can I can uh, get more plant material growing for the same amount of water, so I'll add on more plant material." And of course, when that happens, you're still drawing out as much water as you used to. And the latest research I've seen basically says that yeah, if if you have plenty of water. The plants will grow more and they're more efficient at using water. But in a dry period, you 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 you're screwed either way. The plants are, are not going to get as much water as they need. Um and there's a feedback mechanism here. Um the uh the more erratic rainfall and higher temperatures can lead to less vegetation, which could mean less water demand. On the other hand, if they're using less water, that means there's less evaporation taking place. And so temperatures become higher. Remember 2011, when there wasn't any evaporation taking place, temperatures skyrocketed. So it actually turns out to be fairly complicated. And that's without adding the other bullets that really do complicate things. So let's just cut to a couple factors. First off, model projections of soil moisture. Um, which is one measure of drought. And models are extremely consistent about soils drying out um, due to climate change. And the the you can see most of the United States and Canada are projected to have drier conditions both at the topsoil and deep soil. And one reason for that is um, the higher temperatures lead to greater evaporation. So the soil is not as moist on average. And secondly, um, higher temperatures are also expected to lead to more intense rainfall. And as you probably know, the more intense the rainfall is, the greater the fraction is gonna run off rather than soaking into the ground. And so um, rain with lower soil moisture, we may see more rain soaking in or we might not because of higher rainfall intensity. Again, it's complicated enough. We're going to have to look at climate models to get a sense of what's going on. And it turns out that what's probably going to happen is that during ordinary months, we actually do get less runoff uh, because more water soaks into the soil and then evaporates quickly. But in those very wet months where there's more rain coming than could possibly evaporate, then we get actually more extreme floods. So this unfortunate paradoxical seeming situation where you can get more droughts and more floods at the same time, which um, is certainly an unfortunate aspect of how climate change seems to be playing out. Now here's some work that we did that just got accepted for publication, looking at how much rainfall intensity has changed. And here we're looking at the percent change in what you'd expect to see during the wettest day of the century. 
So Green Follet has a 1% chance of happening in any given year on, on the wettest day of the year. And it's the the darker colors are where there have been bigger observed changes in what to expect. And that's mainly because you've had some big rainstorms there recently, like Hurricane Harvey in Texas, Hurricane Florence in the Carolinas. Uh, Southern Alabama hasn't had any hurricanes in a long time, so they actually have a, a negative trend. But if you average all this together, average over the, the randomness of the hurricanes, you get an increase of about 15% in the intensity of rainfall um, that would be expected on the wettest day of the century uh, over the past 40 years or so. And um, let me let me skip to that a little bit. Um, the reason we did the, the wettest in the century, um, that's something that's called the 100-year rainfall amount. And that gets used in determining the 100-year flood amount, which is generally the definition of a floodplain. So um, we've got, you know, the, it matters whether you're living inside or outside a floodplain because obviously people don't really want to want to live in a place that's susceptible to flooding. And also insurance companies don't really want to insure places that are susceptible to flooding. So the the, the cost of housing is lower for buying, but the expense of living in a house is higher because of the increased cost of insurance. So if we're seeing more intense rainfall, greater amounts of the 100-year rainfall amount, that should mean we're going to get more intense floods. We're going to see bigger floods. And so what's the consequence for floodplains? Well, we saw one consequence during Hurricane Harvey. Um, here's a a study of intense rainfall in the red box, which is basically everywhere along the Gulf Coast that really gets hammered. And um, this study basically looked at what the the odds were of rainfall of good intensity back around 1900 and what the odds would be in 2017. And the way you read this is you can pick your return period, like 100 years, and say, well, the, uh, the three-day amount, which is what they analyzed, is about 15 inches. So you'd expect uh, the wettest three days of the century to be give you 15 inches of rain, maybe. Um, Hurricane Harvey came in around 41 inches, which was um, obviously a ridiculous total. And we have to sort of extend the, the graphs a bit to be able to see what's going on with it. So back in the 1900s, that amount would correspond to rainfall that ought to occur maybe once every 27,000 years, give or take 10,000. And now in 2017, I don't care about once every 9,000 years. So that's about a factor of three uh, increase in frequency. And that corresponded to a seven inch increase in intensity. Now, if you stare at this plot long enough, you'll see that you can't possibly get an increase in intensity without getting an increase in frequency and vice versa. The red line is, is above and to the left of the blue line, no matter where you look. So an increase in intensity at a given frequency means there's got to be an increase in frequency at a given intensity. Depends on whether you're looking horizontally or vertically to go from one line to the next. So in that sense, it's sort of sort of misleading to say that it is rainfall is becoming more frequent and more severe because it can't really do one without doing the other at the same time. Now, here are some of the more severe rainfalls we've ever gotten. We did a study looking at the wettest storms in the United States history over various uh, sizes of areas, over various durations, 48 hours, 72 hours, 120 hours. And uh, we've listed here the top five. Uh, Hurricane Harvey is number one in every single category. From rainfall over 1,000 square miles to rainfall over 50,000 square miles. From two-day two rainstorm to a five-day rainstorm, Harvey wins everything. Um, the other runners-up, at least at the, sh at the 
Smaller area sizes and shorter durations. Those are mostly other tropical storms like Imelda and Florence. Um, but then you've also got, in longer durations, you've got the West Coast peaking up with California, Oregon, uh, and Washington. Uh, basically, atmospheric river storms, as they're now known, are, are some of the wettest storms in the United States. But Harvey wins them all. It's like one ring. So it's hard to imagine we can get anything worse than Hurricane Harvey, except you can't imagine it. This is a uh, the National Hurricane Center's forecast for the track of Hurricane Harvey um, that was issued uh, 1 a.m. Friday, August 25th, so about a day before landfall. And it was literally forecasted to be almost stationary for two and a half days. And we did a little experiment. We said, well, what if it had been that slow? What if we move the rainfall uh, along with the storm and see what happens if it follows a different track? Um, so we did that, looked at a variety of tracks. Um, the, the ones that were wettest had it moving about 30% slower. So this is what actually happened with the storm. Uh, you can see Galveston Bay is over here. Here's Harris County. Uh, the wettest conditions were in Beaumont, Port Arthur, according to this analysis. But if we slow the storm down a bit, rainfall becomes more concentrated. Slow down some more. This is, gives us the maximum point total of over 80 inches of rain uh, in Brazoria County, which would have been pretty impressive. And then uh, this is the maximum amount in Attucks and Barker Reservoirs. Um, so it could have been a lot worse for for. For Houston, obviously not likely to happen, but it's interesting to explore the possibilities. And this scenario, by the way, would have been uh, basically uh, an average of 50 to 60 inches of rain along the entire lower portion of the Brazos River, which would have been quite devastating. And uh, about a one-third more water in Alex and Barker Reservoirs as a result of that sort of thing happening. So this is what some of the flooding looked like. And that's, that's obviously climate change is contributing to that. But climate change is also contributing to this. This is a perfectly ordinary looking uh, neighborhood in the Dallas metropolitan area. It just so happens to be this neighborhood in orange, which is on the edge of the flood zone. So as our estimates of the risk of extreme rainfall increase, homes that were outside the floodplain are going to be inside the floodplain. So even if it doesn't flood there anytime soon, the risk of flooding will be greater and it will pass this arbitrary threshold of a one in a hundred year event such that flood insurance will be required and people will be less inclined to move there and basically, you get six-figure declines in the equity of these homeowners in their homes as a consequence of the climate change, even before you get the natural disaster. Okay, uh, let's talk about one more natural disaster here. And this is um, a flood that took place in Fort Collins, Colorado, back in July 1997. Over uh, upper right is a figure taken at the time. You can see a, a firefighter uh, trying to rescue someone out of a mobile home. Basically, the uh, natural gas line had busted. Mobile homes were being swept downstream along with cars and other vehicles. Uh, the next day, clearly a good bit of devastation. And this had happened without any flood warnings from the National Weather Service. And if you look at the map on the left of rainfall totals, you see that, well, based on those rainfall totals, you certainly would not expect flooding. Uh, you know, two inches of rain in a day is not a big deal, even in Colorado. Well, the problem was the rain occurred in between the gauges for the most part. 
uh, mainly with, with, with a 10 inch total centered in the hills right on the upper edge of Fort Collins. And so a massive flood did sweep through the town, but the uh, the National Weather Service didn't know it was happening. Basically, it was too far away from the from the radar location to be able to detect how heavy the rainfall was. And in addition to that, there's no observations that are to report how heavy the rainfall was. So basically, my counterpoint in Colorado, the state climatologist at the time, Nolan Deskin, um, helped with putting together this map. And the reason they could put together this map is because they found that lots of people had rain gauges. And they were recording the rainfall and measuring it. But there was no mechanism to tell everybody about the rain. And plus, all the rain gauges were a lot of different varieties. So some were more reliable than others and so forth. So the idea was we can, we can do a lot of good, um, including for public safety, by taking advantage of the free labor that people are already putting in due to their own interest in the weather and having them take standard rainfall observations and transmit them. So over on the right is um, rainfall totals during the next heavy rainfall event, which peaked out at nine inches. And you can see there's a bit of a difference in the number of observations available for the National Weather Service in this case. And indeed, this storm was, was well warned for and uh, well understood, and there was no loss of life associated with that event. So that's the motivation for Coco Ross, which originally stood for the Colorado Community Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. But um, turns out that having rainfall observations is not useful merely to Colorado. It soon started spreading to other states, at which point the CEO, first CEO <laughs> changed from Colorado to community. They were able to keep the uh, acronym intact. And uh, right now we've got observations throughout the United States and Canada and uh, the Bahamas as well. Uh, we didn't have cell phones that were smartphones back in 1996, but nowadays it's possible to take your observation and enter it via an app. And the data can be plotted out in near real time and the information goes to the National Centers for Environmental Information becomes part of the Climate Archive. So in Texas, uh, the New Braunfels office, which is, uh, of course, between Austin and San Antonio, was sold on the value of Kokoraz to this event in 2008, when this one observer on the edge of Balcones Escarpment reported 7.12 inches, and neighboring sites were less than a tenth of an inch. So it's easy to assume that that was some sort of erroneous report, but <clears throat> they flagged it as being significant in real time and sent it in as a special report, which went to the Weather Service office, and they reported that all but two hundredths of that fell between 3.30 and 5.30 p.m., so over seven inches of rain in two hours, and that means flash flooding. So the Weather Service issued a flash flood warning for New Braunfels on the basis of that. It turned out to have been this, this innocuous-looking thunderstorm, which was only affecting a corner of the county, but was dumping massive amounts of rain in that one corner of the county. So I mentioned the public safety value for this. Uh, there's also uh, value scientifically in actually having observations of rainfall and understanding the distribution of rain. Um, there's value for uh, understanding water supply and the amount of rain that's fallen and how much water you need for watering. Um, it's useful for monitoring drought. USDA uh, keeps close track of drought conditions. Um, farmers and ranchers, outdoor recreation, teachers and students is basically a, a good education tool as well as 
a nice public benefit. And let's see, not listed on this list is Master Naturalist, which could be listed because Master Naturalists get credit for participating in the Kokoraz program. So here's the current status of the Kokoraz program right now in uh, East Central Texas. And this is a snapshot of rainfall January 22nd through 26th of this past year. And the reds correspond to nine inches or more. And you can see this swath from um, LaGrange, across Brenna, across Huntsville, and up toward Lufkin, where basically you had uh, 10 inches or more of, of rainfall. Now, some of the some of the reports in here are a little suspicious. I don't know if they really got 16 inches here and 20 there, but clearly 10 to 12 inches is is predominant. You can see how it's useful to have multiple redundant observations in order to identify which ones actually look suspicious. Um, the observations tend to be concentrated where people live. So we got Brazos County. Uh, we got the area around Lake Condra where people are monitoring the climate nicely. And the woodlands, um, and of course the Huntsville area has a has a good number as well as a few observers out by Lake Livingston. We can certainly use a few more, um, especially if you know people in Houston County, uh, Crockett and environs. That turns out to be farther away from National Weather Service radars, just about any other spot in East Texas, and so we're chronically having problems estimating the amount of rainfall in that region. So it'd be great to have some ground truth observations, people that are reporting when it rains and when it doesn't rain. Oh, by the way, this, this storm event, four days of rain over 10 inches, um, apparently set the record for the wettest wintertime storm in Texas history. I didn't, didn't realize it at the time, but someone asked me about it later and it's like, yeah, like, gee, that, that actually really was wetter than anything we've seen before. Um, let's see, that covered the rain part. There's also hail and snow. Snow is not that common in Texas, but we do get hail. And there's a, the reports of hail can be done in a couple of different ways. One is you can actually have a hail board, which is basically a, a, a styrofoam board covered in aluminum foil. And the hail makes dents in the board so that you've got direct evidence of how much hail there was by the number of dents how big the hail was by the size of the dents, and also information on the shape of the hailstones. So it's amazing what you can learn from a piece of styrofoam. And of course, with a ruler, you can also get the size of the storm as well. Um, the current record for largest hailstone in Texas is, is well over six inches. So um, if that does turn out to happen, uh, make sure the hail stops before you go out and try to measure it. Um... So I'll point you to the, the website for resources, um, but I want to give you a little brief demonstration of, of how the uh, how the how the whole operation works. So let me uh, stop sharing for the time being, and if you want to uh, view it so that I am lot more largely visible, you can do so. Um, at any rate, this is what the gauge looks like. I need to unblur my background because Artificial intelligence can't tell the difference between uh, uh, a rain gauge and a background. So there we go. This is this is our Kokoraz official rain gauge. It's um, oh, about 12 inches tall. And it's composed of two cylinders with a funnel on top. So it's, it's a detachable funnel. So you can see rain is going to get accumulated in the top and come out this hole at the bottom of it into the cylinder that's in the tube. And the cylinder has gradated measurements on it. So in fact, it takes about an inch of rain to fill up the cylinder. Um, this is obviously taller than one inch. And that's because you're taking rain that falls in this large area and confining it into this relatively narrow area. Uh, so that enables you to actually measure your rainfall in the nearest hundreds of an inch fairly accurately. Of course, in Texas, um, we can get more than an inch of rain in a day. And 
the funnel, it turns out, does not seal onto the tube. So what happens is, if after you've gotten an inch of rain, the rainfall overflows into the rest of the tube. And so you can, once you've taken the first inch out and measured it, you can pour it out and then take your funnel and pour in another inch of rain into the measurement cylinder. Record that. It's good not to rely on your memory, but keep track of how many times you fill up this sucker. And then eventually you'll pour out some that it doesn't fill it up all the way, and you'll have the remaining some number of hundreds of an inch of rainfall. Um, so pretty neat system. Obviously fairly low tech, but it's it's better than most automated systems. And the reason it's better than most automated systems is because most automated systems are something that we call uh, tipping bucket rain gauges. Basically, you've got two buckets that are on a, a pivot. And so when the pivot's like this, water is going into the higher bucket. And once it fills up, it tips and drains out. Then water is going into this bucket until it fills up and it tips but you lose water in terms of measurements during the time in which it's tipping, and that depends upon how rapidly the rainfall is coming in. And there have been uh, totals of differences by as much as 20% in very heavy rainfall events. The only problem with this sucker is if you get more than 11 inches of rain, uh, it fills it up. So on those rare occasions where you do get uh, threatening to get more than a foot of rain in a day, it's, it's helpful to make measurements more than once a day so that the gauge never does fill up. Um, it also uses this for snow. Um, even though snow won't trickle down into the small cylinder, you basically have to uh, take the snow, take the snow that accumulates over the cylinder and melt it and then pour it in to see how much water equivalent there was uh, of, of snow. In terms of snow depth, you measure that just the old-fashioned way by sticking a ruler into the, the ground and seeing how deep the snow is, preferably at several places because wind and snow drifts can, can make the accumulation of snow fairly variable. Uh, for that matter, location of the gauge can matter also. You need to have a nice exposed location so that even if it's windy, a tree is not going to intercept the rainfall that's coming in, which is why I don't actually have a coca rod site on my yard because I don't have a large enough open area to make reliable measurements. I'd rather have no data than have bad data. But if you've got a good spot for it, or you can borrow a neighbor's good spot, uh, you can you can put it on a fence as long as it's above the fence line so it's not nothing getting splashed into it, or sink a post into concrete and uh, just make sure you got the top perfectly level so that it's not biased toward getting rain when the wind's blowing in a particular direction. Okay, let's let me go back to sharing my screen again. And once again, we've got the website here and it has lots of training materials. It's got some cute cartoons, by the way. And uh, you are required to have uh, a standard official gauge, but they they do not cost much. I think the going rate is something like $30 or $40. And uh, the that makes the data homogeneous. Uh, observation from one person is equivalent to the observation from another person. Otherwise, there's no sign-up charge. Uh, this is all funded through donations, which you're not required to make. So here are the current regions. I'm the regional coordinator for everything in pink here, which includes Walker County and surrounding counties, as well as Browson all the way up to Burleson. And uh, if you have any questions or such, you can contact me, and I might be contacting you if there's something suspicious in the data, and the, and the folks in Colorado flag it to see what might be going on. Uh, so, talked a lot about uh, Texas climate, um, and uh, yeah, we could actually have the worst of both worlds and have more droughts and more floods, although it sort of depends upon what we mean by drought and what we mean by flood. It's a fairly... A uh, complicated system that's changing. Uh, the the part that's most clear is 
temperatures are going up both in summer and winter and uh, rainfall intensity is increasing every place everything else requires a little bit more of scratching of the heads so i've got my email address here you can reach me there easily our social media is tag is climate texas and our website is climatetexas.tama.edu so uh thanks for thanks for joining me and I'll be happy to answer any more questions you might have anybody have any questions that i i noticed there was a little discussion in the chat about doing modeling of storms using normal weather predictions when there's so much chaos and climate change going on but i imagine you've got you probably run gazillions of models now <laughs> with, with computers the way they are <laughs> yeah and we're we're uh, one of the one of the challenges is it's hard to, you know, the, the, the typical climate model can't simulate an individual thunderstorm. Um, <clears throat> so it all has to be estimated statistically, but we're not, just now getting to the point where there's enough computer power available. You can actually run things uh, at, a, at a resolution that will actually simulate the dynamics of a, of a thunderstorm. So um, yeah. there's a, there's a project ongoing right now to basically do a 40 year long future simulation uh, over the entire United States at high resolution, they've already done a 40-year historical simulation. Wow! Uh, so that's gonna that's gonna help us a lot in terms of estimating the the impact of climate change on rainfall. Wow, that's amazing. We also there, it's it's possible that artificial intelligence will help there also, yeah, in the sense that right now um, you can train an AI model on historical weather and. Uh, make a weather forecast that's just as good as a dynamical model in about one ten thousandth the time once the thing's trained. Um, but the... Yeah, it, it all depends on how well it's trained. <laughs> right. Well, the issue is if the climate is in the future is different from the climate in the present, right. Right. You know, it doesn't exactly. know what to, you know what what to do with conditions it hasn't seen before. So yeah. that's going to be a bit more of a challenge. All right, so we got one more question. What is your professional opinion of where the safest areas of the country are going to be in the next 30 to 40 years? <laughs> safest? Well, let's see. Not in the middle of an interstate highway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, I, I was actually asked where, where, to, where one ought to be to avoid most of the hazardous impacts of climate change. And the answer I came up with was Pittsburgh. Um, oh. bas basically, you know, it's, it's, it's a cold climate. So as the temperature goes up, it becomes more moderate. Um, yeah. there's plenty of rainfall, so they don't get severe droughts there. Uh, they're far enough east. They don't tend to get much of the way of severe weather either. So, um, yeah, yeah that's my and, answer. And somebody, one of my friends suggested, um, somewhere around in the Great Lakes area, because you've got lots of water. <laughs> yep. Although the Great Lakes so, are changing in elevation a bit, so yeah, yeah. Don't don't necessarily be right on top of the Great Lakes. Yep. Um, another question: Where are we with respect to including ocean models into the climate modeling? I assume you're probably already doing that. Yeah, we do. Um, yeah, you know, that that started happening in the nineteen late nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, and for a long time. They didn't match very well, so it was necessary mm -hmm. to to say, well, how much energy is going from the from the atmosphere to the ocean, and vice versa. Uh, but starting about 15 years ago, then we got the processes down accurate enough that we could just let the thing run and and simulate everything. And so, yeah, there's no that you you can still do climate simulations with just the atmosphere if you want to see, you know, how specific ocean temperature patterns are affecting things. But right. just about every simulation you, you you see for climate projections and every seasonal forecast is based upon models that include simulating what's happening in the ocean as well yeah. as the atmosphere yeah makes sense okay another one more what is the link for the texas extreme weather report well you can go to our website and then look at look for reports in our extreme weather report and uh get it that way uh, the number of letters is a bit too long to be worth writing down but uh okay start yeah. with start with the top level and, and dig in from there so i'll go do that and then i'll, I'll try to send them an email okay um and it, it'll it might my, it might change my... when the new report comes out in a month or so but I'll, i can yeah. update you on that also cool okay um 
that was really great. Uh, a lot of good discussion in the chat about the modeling and all that stuff and some good questions. So wanted to thank you very much for uh, uh, taking your evening and spending it with us and educating us a little bit. You're welcome. My pleasure. Yeah. And uh, everybody, I, the only thing I want to remind you of is there's another Zoom class on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. It's Craig Hensley, who's um, going to talk about citizen science. And he, if you don't know, he is one of a couple of N Texas nature tracker biologists. And if you go on Instagram and look for Texas nature trackers, he's one of the guys that walks around with his phone and looks at nature and, and uh, narrates it. And they're really very interesting. So he's going to be talking to us about citizen science um, using iNaturalist and things like that. So he's a great speaker. Yeah, it is the same Zoom link. So I sent you a note today. It should, everything should work. So, all right. And, and the reason we've been having these Zooms is for some of the speaker schedules, but also we haven't, there's a couple of days that we weren't able to find a building or a room. So that's why we had a couple of Zooms in a row here. So, all right. Well, we'll see you guys on uh, Saturday. Thank you again, John. You're welcome. Good, e good evening, everybody.